All righty, folks, you've been on my channel for any length of time. You know two things. First and foremost, Anna, Aria, Mom Kelly is amazing. And second, the pain in the commercial syndication land is growing. I think it's time we kind of peel it back. We talk about what we are seeing. We'll talk about where the pain is most acute. And we we'll even guess on how some of this might unwind. So, Anna, how you doing? I'm doing great. Good to be here with you. Yes, and thanks again for coming on Sunday. Uh, the Legends of Real Estate invest Investing for four hours was amazing. You were our cleanup hitter. You brought the, the house down. And uh, thank you for being a part of it. You're welcome. It was my pleasure. I really like that format. It was so great to get to hear back from some of our listeners and be able to answer your questions. So let's do it again, Michael. Absolutely. I love it. No PowerPoint. I love it. I love it. Yeah, no PowerPoint. So yeah, I'm down. So so let's talk about it. I, I'm sure with your network, uh, you're hearing from what I'm going to call new syndicators. So let's define that. Anybody who's been syndicating three years or less, I'm going to put in that camp. If you've been doing this 10 years or more, you've seen cycles. But if you got right. into this in the heyday and got lucky, right? Because I sold apartments when I thought cap rates were compressed and they went significantly lower. Right. If you got lucky and then you had to start beating up your spreadsheets with bridge debt, IO, all of these other things, that's what I'm calling a new syndicator. And that's where I think the pain is building and they're not ready for it. And I think the pressure is, it's like a kettle. It's already starting to steam and it's going to start screaming soon. What are you hearing? Yeah, definitely. You know, I'll, I'll say this, you know, full disclosure, although I've been investing since 98, so 25 years now, since I bought my very first property, um, and I started doing small multis in 2007, I really have only been like syndicating a little over four years, about four and a half years since I did my first joint ventures and then turned into syndications as well. Um, but I'm thankful for all the experience that I had, you know, running and operating apartments through multiple cycles that, that allowed me to have some foresight into the possibility of some of these things happening. Um, but in terms of, you know, newer, you know, I've only been syndicating for four and a half years, something like that as well. And so um, I'm, I'm seeing a little bit of, of that pain. Um, and it's definitely, to your point, going to hit harder the people that are either new to syndication or they're just new to commercial real estate, even if they've been investing. Um, but even really experienced syndicators and operators are also experiencing some pain of the current shifts in the market that really nobody could clearly foresee the extent to how these things would play out. So um, commercial definitely has, has pain. And I think the biggest challenge has been if you only got into real estate. So let's talk about, you know, real experience in real estate in the last few years. Um, all you've seen is an up cycle. So we've only seen real estate going up since the last great recession, we really haven't experienced a time where rates were going up and values were potentially falling um, or debt couldn't be refinanced in at low rates. And so that's been the part that everybody's been so shocked about because we've had this really longer than a decade of fairly low interest rates. And the last three years, they've come down substantially. Everyone just kind of assumed rates are going to stay this way. And so getting into commercial where the risk is a little greater than um, single family per se, per se, is that your loans are not fixed for 30 years. So you get short-term loans. They're often only five or 10-year loans. And even if they're longer loans, you get short-term rates. So they're fixed for a couple of years. And then whenever they come due, you've got to reset at the new higher interest rates. And that's really what's causing the huge pain is people's assumption that I can refinance in two years, I can get bridge debt, um, we're going to create massive value. And then, you know, if we can't sell it, we'll refi. Well, the credit markets have changed quite a bit, both rates and the LTVs available. And that's where the primary pain is in multifamily. Yeah, I think there's a couple of things. And and I, I've been warning about this for a while because both you and I have more than two decades experience. And while the part of the market that's going to feel it has changed, the, the consumer or investor behavior was so predictable. Back True. in 06, the worst iteration for residential loans, 50% were arms, most alt A, you know, all the toxic stuff we now know. I mean, 
you go to you go to events and everybody is essentially saying housing only goes one way, right? Housing never goes down. They look at all right. the pretty charts and, and, and we kind of know how that ends. But what was it? Right. It was short term debt, two years usually, interest only, even heaven forsake negative amortization on some of them, right? So you're taking you're not even making a full payment, you're sticking it on the back. And we just did that again in a new part of the market with a lot more money. There's a lot more zeros on these loans. Right. Did you hear yes. about the 3,200 unit deal in Houston, Texas? I think it was Arbor was the lender. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm very familiar with that. Um, it have become more and more familiar with some of the details of that. And, you know, I, I think there's a, a few things, there's definitely lessons to be learned there and it won't be the first, uh, it, it won't be the last, um, the it's last, just one yes. of the first of, of unfortunately other deals that'll probably have the same pain. But to your point, you know, we've been talking about for a few years being at the peak of a very long expansion cycle and, and understanding with our experience that the life likelihood is there is going to be some inflation because of all the money printing. There's going to be some, you know, contraction in the market. You know, we didn't know to what extent, but but you can kind of see the signs to your point. And when you're at the top, there's this FOMO. The call of the day is fear of missing out. And so people want to do really good deals. And the reality is the low interest rates available with easy money and easy credit made it easy to get into deals. Um, and as long as you thought that rates would continue to stay low, you really didn't have too much worry um, if you were buying a value add deal that really had significant upside. Now, when we start to see that and everybody says it's only going to get better and it can't, you can't lose, that's when you have to start getting really, really cautious. And so, especially with leverage, I was having a conversation with my son yesterday actually about leverage and borrowing on margin to trade in stocks, right? It's totally different than real estate. But I, I brought up the, the point that when you have leverage, it can absolutely magnify your returns, sometimes four or 500% um, higher returns than you would if you paid cash. But it also magnifies the pain because when you have leverage, you, you're dealing now with millions of dollars of debt. And it's not easy to just go refinance and come up with a little extra cash if LTVs come down, if values come down. You know, you're relying on on banks to say yes to refinancing an asset that may not have gone up in value and they may give you less money. And so leverage is is what took down the market in the Great Recession in 2008, 2009. And I learned those lessons of the people that got burned the hardest during that time were those that had adjustable rate mortgages. And so I've I've had that as a very serious um, lesson on my mind, and it's kept me from going into bridge debt. I didn't do any bridge debt on my larger properties. Um, I did do variable rate mortgages because that's just how commercials work. And so we bought things like rate cap insurance. One of the things that's really happening right now, um, just so people understand, it's not just, it's not just greedy operators who made the mistakes of debt. We have a property that we bought with um, agency debt, but it's a variable rate. Now we bought a rate cap because we said, hey, rates could go up if inflation starts coming up, rates could go up, let's buy insurance that, that our rate will be capped at a certain amount. Well, what's happening, Michael, and this is across I would say the vast majority of multifamily loans right now um, that used bridge debt or a variable rate mortgage of some sort with commercial is that no one had ever had to escrow for future rate caps. It just hasn't been a thing. So rate cap insurance is kind of a new thing. Well, I'll give you an example. And this has been magnified by many, many people in the in the multifamily space, including the um, including the types of deals that you talked about with Arbor, right? They got in at below four percent, and then they needed to to refi. I think at seven, eight percent rates, and just couldn't cover the debt. So rate cap insurance, for an example, on for a couple million, well, double digit millions of of rate cap insurance, was about thirty six thousand dollars for a two year rate cap. Okay. At the height of last year, that rate cap renewal was a million dollars, Michael. 36,000 
the cost, we think, okay, well, if it comes due, we'll just renew the rate cap because yeah. you can. And so we estimate that the cost is going to be the same as it was when we got it. Well, sure. when you go from a $36,000 a year insurance to a million dollar a year insurance, and the lender says, you have no choice but to buy it again. You have to now escrow for it, and we're going to take it out of your mortgage payment. You're dealing with hundreds Ouch. of thousands of dollars a month in order to pay that million dollar rate cap. So even if you have a really well cash flowing, very well operated deal with experienced operators, most op most apartments aren't kicking off a million dollars a year in cash flow above and beyond their their cost. No, and no, so no. that one thing that nobody has ever experienced before because of rates going up make it not just that they have a refi problem, but they have an operational cash flow problem because of the rate caps. And so yeah. the variable debt that's really specific to commercial creates tremendous risk that most of us didn't see this piece of this happening. And I didn't see rate cap insurance going up, but that's what's causing a lot of pain right now. So the, the distress is just really starting, to be honest oh, with you. Oh, it's just starting. So let me break down what I've read on Arbor. It sounds like you know you know it oh, you know well. This this is what I've read. Sure. Essentially, it was a, a collection of I think four apartment buildings, thirty two hundred units in Houston, Texas. Uh, it was purchased last year, so twelve or thirteen months ago. Relatively short. They are C class apartments. Um, I think the deal. I think the original purchase was like two hundred and sixty million. They had a loan for like one ninety. So they raised probably raised a hundred million bucks in LP, right? The seventy million equity plus operating capital, and yeah, it was the interest rates, right? Their first their purchase was in the threes, and they had to refi it in the eights, and boom, didn't work. So what yeah. happened is it it's already been auctioned off. The LPs lost everything, all hundred million yes. bucks, and then yes. the bank took about a fourteen percent haircut on the note. Uh, Somebody else is already operating the building. That's that's kind of what I know. Do I have anything wrong? Yeah, you know, I, I think generally speaking, yes. I think there there's a couple of things here. So some were bought in 2021 and some were bought in 2022. Okay. Um, but but here's the thing: they were done with short term bridge debt. So that's you know the the first issue that we just spent some time talking about, and the rates went up, and they just simply couldn't cover debt service payments that were double. But the other thing, and this is something that I've talked a lot about on this show, when you're talking about like A, B, C, D class, like D is a war zone, A is brand new, high end, great schools, low crime. I have been beating on the drum of if you want recession resilient properties, and properties that are going to continue to go up in value, be able to have rents go up with increasing expenses, you need to be in those A to B class areas with great schools, low crime, great jobs. That makes a huge difference in the people that are living in your apartments and their ability to continue to pay rent when times are tough. And the reality is that these properties were not in good areas. In fact, two of them were in areas that I would call a D-class area, um, war zone parts of, of Houston, where there's drive-by shootings, carjackings, you know, murders, drugs, gangs. You don't want to be in those types of properties. So I have basically passed on any kind of properties that are in C minus, even C areas. I like B plus, C plus um, area if it's really been regentrifying for air, for years and doing really well. You want to have the worst properties in the nicest areas, not the nice property in the worst areas. So I don't care how much money you put into a property, making it look nice, making it nicer. If the area is really tough, you're going to struggle to have people that want to live in your complex because of the crime. And these, yeah. a couple of these properties had multiple murders, um, infestation of, of gangs, fires, all kinds of issues. And so Property quality matters, location quality matters. And, and when you have great times, those properties struggle, but you have hard times and they're really going to struggle. So, you know, that was part of it. I, I think the inexperience of the operator, they were part of a really big, you know, coaching group and a bunch of people got together and decided, hey, we're going to own and operate apartment buildings. Um, I can already hear they, the social media. We own 3,200 units. 
Absolutely. Yeah. But they were inexperienced. And so one of the things that I tell people, and I think this is a lesson for us to learn from, right, is to say, um, bigger is not always better. And I own a lot of, I own large apartments. I own small apartments. I own singles and vacation rentals. I'm agnostic as to what, you know, what type of investment it is necessarily. They all have good, bad, and ugly. But I tell people often, don't think that for you to be a rock star investor, you've got to jump straight into large multifamily. With large zeros comes large risk. And if you fail small as you learn, you know, I made lots of mistakes in the beginning on a four unit or an eight unit or a 10 unit, you can get out of it much more quickly. But people that are newer starting to operate huge buildings with bad areas that have need a lot of experience in order to work. When times get hard and things happen, they they just don't have the experience to be able to navigate out of that. And so, you know, I, I don't know the the operator personally. Um, you know, I'm not going to say that it was necessarily a bad guy. They probably got in over their heads. I know yeah. they were newer to syndication, didn't learn the lessons. And unfortunately, many, many investors trusted inexperienced operators to, yeah. with their money in really poor areas. They had the FOMO and, mm -hmm. you know, high potential returns makes people take risk that, you know, they may or should not have taken in hindsight. Yeah, the, you know, again, this money, in my opinion, this money was lost the day the deal closed. It had no chance the day the deal closed. It, you know, the only question yeah. was when when was it going to be recognized? I just want to paint as we wrap up number one, kind of how this will, you know, it, my experience in this as an outsider. I don't, I'm not a part of any syndications. Don't syndicate, but to talk to kind of paint the vision for folks, the folks that are already in them, right? Again, loans have to be refied. Certainly, if you're a bridge debt, you've got to get out of it. So kind of step one of this is what's called a capital call. It would not yes. shock me that there are lots of emails and phone calls going out saying, hey, we need 50 grand or whatever it is right. from different investors because of right. this, whether it's rate cap insurance or Absolutely. more reserves or whatever. And most that syndications do have built in the ability to have a capital call if needed, because if you run out of cash, you lose the property. Everybody loses everything. So if there is a cash crunch, you have to pay down that debt a little bit. Investors, unfortunately, will have to come up with more money to keep the property going in order to save the property. So that'll be step one. I wouldn't shock me that lots of that is already happening. Step two, if that doesn't happen or doesn't perform or the lender says, hey, you know, you, you've you, there's lots of covenants in commercial loans where they could basically say the loan's coming due. We could have some fire sale prices, uh, basically wiping out some, if not all, the equity, because the lender is only going to care about their debt. Uh, I don't think we're really anywhere close to this. I think this Houston example is early. I think there will be more, but later. Right. Yeah. Yeah, then, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I do think that lenders will start to try, and I'm sure that Arbor tried as well, to work with the buyer. They don't want to foreclose on property, but certain loan covenants, especially if they've been sold, if the loans have been sold, it's not easy for them to just change the terms of these loans. And so, you know, hopefully lenders start to help, you know, help buyers to restructure some things, maybe lower the escrow, um, you know, as, as rates start to kind of stabilize and we see a clear path from the Fed, the cost of rate cap insurance has gone down significantly again. And so, you know, if the lenders are working with their buyers, hopefully they're going to, you know, not just pull the plug and take property. So don't be panicked if you're an LP, you know, as long as there's cash and you're meeting the debt payments, generally speaking, the lenders are going to try to work with, with the borrower. But there is a risk that if you don't make the payments and you don't make your escrow payments, the lender could put it under lockbox and could take the property back. Yeah. And then the last thing to talk about, again, for me personally and, and many others on the channel, we're talking about hundreds and thousands of units. I believe the same pain is going on in the five to 40 unit buildings. The same debt was offered, the same inexperienced operators. People were chasing units. Uh, I think we're early, right? Still first inning. Uh, but I've been here before. There will be pain and opportunity in that part of the market as well, which I'm I'm getting ready for. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, we have to look at this and say where there's pain, there's opportunity for us. And so, you know, I, I spent the last couple of days very slowly because of hospital and visit and all of that, but underwriting, you know, apartment deals. And so we're looking at deals. We're starting to see people that really need to exit 
And, you know, because the interest rates are higher for us now, for us to make sure that those deals are safe and provide cash flow and wiggle room, you know, we have to just simply pay less. And so, you know, we're coming in, you know, with offers that are really close to the debt on the property. Not that we knew what the debt on the property was, but we're having to discount what we will pay for those properties because of the higher debt. And so that's what happens as rates go up in order to generate the same returns. You've got to pay less to get that same property. So there's huge opportunity and, and we're ready for that. We're excited about that opportunity oh, because yeah. a lot of these assets, Michael, are quality assets, you know, quality assets in quality areas. I don't think most of them are going to go back. You're still going to have buyers that say, we want this asset. It's a great asset. It's just that the seller, unfortunately, has this issue with not being able to refi right now. They may have to take a, a haircut on their returns. But but long term, these, these properties, a lot of times, are really great properties. They've still got upside. You just have to buy them right. And so um, yeah. for us, it, it's an opportunity to buy some things at much uh, lower prices than before. And we're really excited about that. Yeah, I, I want, I'll close with this kind of, it's been a kind of a downer episode. I'll close on a positive note. The, the syndications that are done over the next two years will be some of the best vintage, yes. certainly compared to the last two. The last two is going to prove to be a disaster on in total, uh, but the next yeah. two years are going to be amazing. Ab absolutely. And, you know, if you understand the fundamentals of of providing housing to people, whether it's single family homes, multifamily homes, um, et cetera, you know that there is significant demand for your product. And so, you know, you've got leases that can reset. If you're in amazing areas and we're only investing in high quality areas with stronger GDP locally than there is nationally, lots of great jobs, lots of people moving in. These companies are still hiring. They're still building their factories. You know, we're having a lot of um, deglobalization and things coming back and manufacturing coming back. And so if you can look past, you know, the, the tree of recession and pain and see that on the other side of that, um, you know, apartments are very recession resilient. They're the most recession resilient asset. And on the other side of that, there's still growth and opportunity. So if you can put aside the fear and say, let's invest back in the fundamentals, good debt on good quality assets and good quality locations, there's still tremendous upside in a lot of those properties. So we're excited. Me too. Anna, where can people follow you? Great. You can find me on social media at Anna Kelly, REI Mom, my website, reimom.com, and here every week on your show and on my channel on your um, show. Playlist. She, have a, playlist. she has the her own playlist, Anna. Thank you yes. very much. <laughs>